Chapter 1, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. This recording is for educational purposes only. It goes a long way back, some 20 years. All my life I had been looking for something, and everywhere I turned someone tried to tell me what it was. I accepted their answers too, though they were often in contradictory and even self-contradictory. I was naive. I was looking for myself and asking everyone except myself questions which I, and only I, could answer. It took me a long time and much painful boomeranging of my expectations to achieve a realization everyone else appears to have been born with, that I am nobody but myself. But first I had to discover that I am an invisible man. And yet I am no freak of nature nor of history. I was in the cards other things having been equal or unequal 85 years ago. I am not ashamed of my grandparents for having been slaves. I am only ashamed of myself for having at one time been ashamed. About 85 years ago, they were told that they were free, united with others of our country in everything pertaining to the common good and in everything social, separate, like the fingers of a hand. And they believed it. They exulted in it. They stayed in their place, worked hard, and brought up my father to do the same. But my grandfather is the one. He was an odd old guy, my grandfather, and I am told I take after him. It was he who caused the trouble. On his deathbed, he called my father to him and said, Son, after I'm gone, I want you to keep up the good fight. I never told you, but our life is a war, and I have been a traitor all my born days a spy in the enemy's country ever since I gave up my gun back in the Reconstruction. Live with your head in the lion's mouth. I want you to overcome them with yeses, undermine them with grins, agree to death and destruction. Let them swallow you till they vomit or bust wide open. They thought that the old man had gone out of his mind. He had been the meekest of men. The younger children were rushed from the room. The shades drawn and the flame of the lamp turned so low that it sputtered on the wick like the old man's breathing. Learn it to the young'uns, he whispered fiercely. Then he died. But my folks were more alarmed over his last words than over his dying. It was as though he had not died at all. His words caused so much anxiety. I was warned emphatically to forget what he had said, and indeed this is the first time it has been mentioned outside the family circle. It had a tremendous effect upon me, however. I could never be sure of what he meant. Grandfather had been a quiet old man who never made any trouble. Yet on his deathbed he had called himself a traitor and a spy, and he had spoken of his meekness as a dangerous activity. It became a constant puzzle which lay unanswered in the back of my mind. And whenever things went well for me, I remembered my grandfather and felt guilty and uncomfortable. It was as though I was carrying out his advice in spite of myself. And to make it worse, everyone loved me for it. I was praised by the most lily-white men of the town. I was considered an example of desirable conduct, just as my grandfather had been. And what puzzled me was that the old man had defined it as treachery. When I was praised for my conduct, I felt a guilt that in some way I was doing something that was really against the wishes of the white folks that if they had understood, they would have desired me to act just the opposite, that I should have been sulky and mean, and that they really would have been, and that really would have been what they wanted, even though they were fooled and thought that they wanted me to act as I did. It made me afraid that someday they would look upon me as a traitor and I would be lost. Still, I was more afraid to act any other way because they didn't like that at all. The old man's words were like a curse. On my graduation day, I delivered the oration in which I showed that humility was the secret, indeed, the very essence of progress. Not that I believed this. How could I, remembering my grandfather? I only believed that it worked. It was a great success. Everyone praised me, and I was invited to give a speech at a gathering of the town's leading white citizens. It was a triumph for our whole community. It was in the main ballroom of the leading hotel. When I got there, I discovered that it was on the occasion of a smoker, and I was told that since I was to be there anyway, I might as well take part in the Battle Royal to be fought by some of my schoolmates as part of the entertainment. The Battle Royal came first. 
All of the town's big shots were there in their tuxedos, wolfing down the buffet foods, drinking beer and whiskey, and smoking black cigars. It was a large room with a high ceiling. Chairs were arranged in neat rows around three sides of a portable boxing ring. The fourth side was clear, revealing a gleaming space of polished floor. I had some misgivings over the battle royal, by the way, not from a distaste for fighting, but because I didn't care too much for the other fellows who were to take part. They were tough guys who seemed to have no grandfather's curse worrying their minds. No one could mistake their toughness. And besides, I suspected that fighting a battle royal might detract from the dignity of my speech. In those pre-invisible days, I visualized myself as a potential Booker T. Washington. But the other fellows didn't care too much for me either, and there were nine of them. I felt superior to them in my way, and I didn't like the manner in which they were all crowded together into the servants' elevator. Nor did I like that they, nor did they like my being there. In fact, as the warmly lighted floors flashed past the elevator, we had words over the fact that I, by taking part in the fight, had knocked one of their friends out of a night's work. We were led out of the elevator through a Rococo hall into an anteroom and told to get into our fighting togs. Each of us was issued a pair of boxing gloves and ushered out into a big mirrored hall, which we entered looking cautiously about us and whispering, lest we might accidentally be heard above the noise of the room. It was foggy with cigar smoke, and already the whiskey was taking effect. I was shocked to see some of the most important men of the town quite tipsy. They were all there. Bankers, lawyers, judges, doctors, fire chiefs, teachers, merchants, even one of the more fashionable pastors. Something we could not see was going on up front. A clarinet was vibrating sensuously, and the men were standing up and moving eagerly forward. We were a small, tight group clustered together, our bare upper bodies touching and shining with anticipatory sweat, while up front the big shots were becoming increasingly excited over something we still could not see. Suddenly I heard the school superintendent, who had told me to come, yell, Bring up the shines, gentlemen! Bring up the little shines! We were rushed up to the front of the ballroom, where it smelled even more strongly of tobacco and whiskey. Then we were pushed into place. I almost wet my pants. A sea of faces, some hostile, some amused, ringed around us, and in the center facing us stood a magnificent blonde, stark naked. There was dead silence. I felt a blast of cold air chill me. I tried to back away, but they were behind me and around me. Some of the boys stood with lowered heads, trembling. I felt a wave of irrational guilt and fear. My teeth chattered. My skin turned to goose flesh. My knees knocked. Yet I was strongly attracted and looked in spite of myself. Had the price of looking been blindness, I would have looked. The hair was yellow like that of a circus cupid doll. The face heavily powdered and rouged as though to form an abstract mask. The eyes hollow and smeared a cool blue, the color of a baboon's butt. I felt a desire to spit upon her as my eyes brushed slowly over her body. Her breasts were firm and round as the domes of East Indian temples, and I stood so close as to see the fine skin texture and beads of pearly perspiration glistening like dew around the pink and erected buds of her nipples. I wanted at one and the same time to run from the room, to sink through the floor, or to go to her and cover her from my eyes and the eyes of the others with my body, to feel the soft thighs, to caress her and destroy her, to love her and murder her, to hide from her and yet to stroke where below the small American flag tattooed upon her belly her thighs formed a capital V. I had a notion that of all in the room she saw only me with her impersonal eyes. And then she began to dance, a slow, sensuous movement, the smoke of a hundred cigars clinging to her like the thinnest of veils. She seemed like a fair bird girdled in veils, calling to me from an angry surface of some gray and threatening sea. I was transported. Then I became aware of the clarinet playing and the big shots yelling at us. Some threatened us if we looked, and others if we did not. On my right, I saw one boy faint, and now a man grabbed a silver pitcher from a table and stepped close as he dashed ice water upon him and stood him up and forced two of us to support him as his head hung and moans issued from his thick, bluish lips. Another boy began to plead to go home. He was the largest of the group, wearing dark red fighting trunks, much too small to conceal the erection which projected from him as though an answer to the insinuating 
low registered moaning of the clarinet. He tried to hide himself with his boxy gloves. And all the while, the blonde continued dancing, smiling faintly at the big shots who watch you with fascination and faintly smiling at our fear. I noticed a certain merchant who followed her hungrily, his lips loose and drooling. He was a large man who wore diamond studs in a shirt front, which swelled with the ample paunch underneath. And each time the blonde swayed her undulating hips, he ran his hand through the thin hair of his bald head, and with his arms upheld, his posture clumsy like that of an intoxicated panda, wound his belly in a slow and obscene grind. The creature was completely hypnotized. The music had quickened. As the dancer flung herself about with a detached expression on her face, the men began reaching out to touch her. I could see their beefy fingers sink into the soft flesh. Some of the others tried to stop them, and she began to move around the floor in graceful circles as they gave chase, slipping and sliding over the polished floor. It was mad. Chairs went crashing. Drinks were spilt as they ran laughing and howling after her. They caught her just as she reached a door, raised her from the floor, and tossed her as college boys are tossed at a hazing. And above her red, fixed, smiling lips, I saw the terror and disgust in her eyes, almost like my own terror and that which I saw on some of the other boys. As I watched, they tossed her twice, and her soft breasts seemed to flatten against the air, and her legs flung wildly as she spun. Some of the more sober ones helped her to escape, and I started off the floor heading for the ante room with the rest of the boys. Some of us still crying and in hysteria, but as we tried to leave, we were stopped and ordered to get into the ring. There was nothing to do but what we were told. All ten of us climbed under the ropes and allowed ourselves to be blindfolded with broad bands of white cloth. One of the men seemed to feel a bit sympathetic and tried to cheer us up as we stood with our backs against the ropes. Some of us tried to grin. See that boy over there? One of the men said. I want you to run across at the bell and give it to him right in the belly. If you don't get him, I'm going to get you. I don't like his looks. Each of us was told the same. The blindfolds were put on. Yet, even then, I had been going over my speech. In my mind, each word was as bright as flame. I felt the cloth pressed into place, and frowned so that it would be loosened when I relaxed. But now I felt a sudden fit of blind terror. I was unused to darkness. It was as though I had suddenly found myself in a dark room filled with poisonous cotton mouths. I could hear the bleary voices yelling insistently for the battle royal to begin. Get going in there! Let me at that big N-word! I strained to pick up the school superintendent's voice as though to squeeze some security out of that slightly more familiar sound. Let me at those black sons of bitches, someone yelled. No, Jackson, no, another voice yelled. Here, somebody help me hold Jack. I want to get at that ginger-colored N-word. Tear him limb from limb, the first voice yelled. I stood against the ropes, trembling. For in those days, I was what they called ginger-colored and he sounded as though he might crunch me between his teeth like a crisp ginger cookie. Quite a struggle was going on. Chairs were being kicked about, and I could hear voices grunting as with terrific effort. I wanted to see, to see more desperately than ever before, but the blindfold was tight as a thick skin puckering scab, and when I raised my gloved hands to push the layers of white aside, a voice yelled, Oh no, you don't, black bastard. Leave that alone. Ring the bell before Jackson kills him a coon, someone boomed in sudden silence. And I heard the bell clang and the sound of the feet scuffling forward. A glove smacked against my head. I pivoted, striking out stiffly as someone went past, and felt a jar ripple along the length of my arm to my shoulder. Then it seemed as though all nine of the boys had turned upon me at once. Blows pounded me from all sides while I struck out as best I could. So many blows landed upon me that I wondered if I were not the only blindfolded fighter in the ring, or if the man called Jackson hadn't succeeded in getting me after all. Blindfolded, I could no longer control my motions. I had no dignity. I stumbled about like a baby or a drunken man. The smoke had become thicker, and with each new blow it seemed to sear and further restrict my lungs. My saliva became like hot, bitter glue, a glove connected with my head filling my mouth with warm blood. 
It was everywhere. I could not tell if the moisture I felt upon my body was sweat or blood. A blow landed hard against the nape of my neck. I felt myself going over, my head hitting the floor. Streaks of blue light filled the black world behind the blindfold. I lay prone, pretending that I was knocked out, but felt myself seized by hands and yanked to my feet. Get going, black boy. Mix it up. My arms were like lead, my head smarting from blows. I managed to feel my way to the ropes and held on, trying to catch my breath. A glove landed in my midsection, and I went over again, feeling as though the smoke had become a knife jabbed into my guts. Pushed this way and that by the legs milling around me, I finally pulled erect and discovered that I could see the black, sweat-washed forms weaving in the smoky blue atmosphere like drunken dancers weaving to the rapid drum-like thuds of blows. Everyone fought hysterically. It was complete anarchy. Everybody fought everybody else. No group fought together for long. Two, three, four fought one, then turned to fight each other, were themselves attacked. Blows landed below the belt and in the kidney, with the gloves open as well as closed, and with my eye partly opened now, there was not so much terror. I moved carefully, avoiding blows, although not so many as to attract attention, fighting from group to group. The boys groped about like blind, cautious crabs, crouching to protect their midsections, their heads pulled in short against their shoulders, their arms stretched nervously before them, with their fists testing the smoke-filled air like knobbed feelers of hypersensitive snails. In one corner I glimpsed a boy violently punching the air and heard him scream in pain as he smashed his hand against a ring post. For a second I saw him bent over holding his hand, then going down as a blow caught his unprotected head. I played one group against the other, slipping in and throwing a punch, then stepping out of range while pushing the others into the melee to take the blows blindly aimed at me. The smoke was agonizing, and there were no rounds, no bells at three-minute intervals to relieve our exhaustion. The room spun around me in a swirl of lights, smoke, sweating bodies surrounded by tense, white faces. I bled from both nose and mouth, the blood spattering upon my chest. The men kept yelling, Slug him, black boy! Knock his guts out! Uppercut him! Kill him! Kill that big boy! Taking a fake fall, I saw a boy going down heavily beside me, as though we were felled by a single blow. I saw a sneaker-clad foot shoot into his groin as the two who had knocked him down stumbled upon him. I rolled out of range, feeling a twinge of nausea. The harder we fought, the more threatening the men became, and yet I had begun to worry about my speech again. How would it go? Would they recognize my ability? What would they give me? I was fighting automatically when suddenly I noticed that one of the another, one after another of the boys were leaving the ring. I was surprised, filled with panic, as though I had been left alone with an unknown danger. Then I understood. The boys had arranged it among themselves. It was the custom for the two men left in the ring to slug it out for the winner's prize. I discovered this too late. When the bell sounded, two men in tuxedos leaped to the ring and removed the blindfold. I found myself facing Tatlock, the biggest of the gang. I felt sick at my stomach. Hardly had the bell stopped ringing in my ears and it clanged again and I saw him moving swiftly forward me. Thinking of nothing else to do, I hit him smash on the nose. He kept coming, bringing the rank, sharp violence of stale sweat. His face was a black blank of a face, only his eyes alive with hate of me and aglow with a feverish terror from what had happened to us all. I became anxious. I wanted to deliver my speech, and he came at me as though he meant to beat it out of me. I smashed him again and again, taking his blows as they came. Then, on a sudden impulse, I struck him lightly, and as we clinched, I whispered, Bake like I knocked you out. You can have the prize. I'll break your behind, he whispered hoarsely them? For me, son of a bitch. They were yelling at us to break it up, and Tatlock spun me half around with a blow, and as a joggled camera sweeps in a reeling scene, I saw the howling red faces crouching tense beneath the cloud of blue-gray smoke. For a moment the world wavered, unraveled, flowed, then my head cleared and Tatlock bounced before me. That fluttering shadow before my eyes was his jabbing left hand. Then falling forward, my head against his damp shoulder, I whispered, I'll make it five dollars more. Go to hell. But his muscles relaxed a trifle beneath my pressure, and I breathed. Seven. Give it to your ma, he said, ripping me beneath the heart. And while I still held him, I butted him and moved away. 
I felt myself bombarded with punches. I fought back with hopeless desperation. I wanted to deliver my speech more than anything else in the world because I felt that only these men could truly judge my ability. And now the stupid clown was ruining my chances. I began fighting carefully now, moving in to punch him and out again with my greater speed. A lucky blow to his chin and I had him going too until I heard a loud voice yell, I got my money on the big boy. Hearing this, I almost dropped my guard. I was confused. Should I try to win against the voice out there? Would not this go against my speech? And was not this a moment for humility, for non-resistance? A blow to my head as I danced about sent my right eye popping like a jack-in-the-box and settled my dilemma. The room went red as I fell. It was a dream fall, my body languid and fastidious as to where to land, until the floor became impatient and smashed up to meet me. A moment later, I came to. A hypnotic voice said, Five, emphatically and I lay there hazily watching a dark red spot of my own blood shaping itself into a butterfly, glistening and soaking into the soiled gray world of the canvas. When the voice drawled ten, I was lifted up and dragged to a chair. I sat dazed, my eye pained and swelled with each throb of my pounding heart, and I wondered if now I would be allowed to speak. I was wringing wet, my mouth still bleeding. We were grouped along the wall now. The other boys ignored me as they congratulated Tatlock and speculated as to how much they would be paid. One boy whimpered over his smashed hand. Looking up front, I saw attendants in white jackets rolling the portable ring away and placing a small square rug on the vacant space surrounded by chairs. Perhaps, I thought, I will stand on the rug to deliver my speech. Then the MC called to us, Come on up here, boys, and get your money. We ran forward to where the men laughed and talked in their chairs, waiting. Everyone seemed friendly now. There it is on the rug, the man said. I saw the rug covered with coins of all dimensions and a few crumpled bills, but what excited me scattered here and there were the gold pieces. Boys, it's all yours, the man said. You get all you can grab. That's right, Sambo, a blonde man said, winking at me confidentially. I trembled with excitement, forgetting my pain. I would get the gold and the bills, I thought. I would use both hands. I would throw my body against the boys nearest me to block them from the gold. Get down around that rug now, the man commanded, and don't anyone touch it until I give the signal. This ought to be good, I heard. As told, we got around the square rug on our knees. Slowly the man raised his freckled hand as we followed it upward with our eyes. I heard... These N-words look like they're about to pray. Then, ready, the man said, Go! I lunged for a yellow coin lying on the blue design of the carpet, touching it and sending a surprised shriek to join those rising around me. I tried frantically to remove my hand, but could not let go. A hot, violent force tore through my body, shaking me like a wet rat. The rug was electrified. The hair bristled up on my head as I shook myself free. My muscles jumped. My nerves jangled, writhed, but I saw that this was not stopping the other boys. Laughing and in fear and embarrassment, some were holding back and scooping up the coins knocked off by the painful contortions of the others. The men roared above us as we struggled. Pick it up, goddammit! Pick it up! Someone called like a bass-voiced parrot. Go on, get it! <clears throat> I crawled rapidly around the floor, picking up the coins, trying to avoid the coppers, and to get greenbacks and the gold. Ignoring the shock by laughing as I brushed the coins off quickly, I discovered that I could contain the electricity. A contradiction, but it works. Then the men began to push us onto the rug. Laughing embarrass embarrassedly, we struggled out of their hands and kept after the coins. We were all wet and slippery and hard to hold. Suddenly I saw a boy lifted into the air, glistening with sweat like a circus seal, and dropped his wet back landing flush upon the charged rug. Heard him yell and saw him literally dance upon his back, his elbows beating a frenzied tattoo upon the floor, his muscles twitching like the flesh of a horse stung by many flies. When he finally rolled off, his face was gray, and no one stopped him when he ran from the floor amid booming laughter. Get the money, the MC called. That's good, hard American cash. 
As we snatched and grabbed, snatched and grabbed, I was careful not to come too close to the rug now, and when I felt the hot whiskey breath descend upon me like a cloud of foul air, I reached out and grabbed the leg of a chair. It was occupied, and I held on desperately. Let go, N-word! Let go! The huge body wavered down to mine as he tried to push me free, but my body was slippery and he was too drunk. It was Mr. Colcord who owned a chain of movie houses and entertainment palaces. Each time he grabbed me, I slipped out of his hands. It became a real struggle. I feared the rug more than I did the drunk, so I held on, surprising myself for a moment by trying to topple him upon the rug. It was such an enormous idea that I found myself actually carrying it out. I tried not to be obvious, yet when I grabbed his leg, trying to tumble him out of the chair, he raised up, roaring with laughter, and looking at me with soberness, dead in the eye, kicked me viciously in the chest. The chair leg flew out of my hand and I felt myself going and rolled. It was as though I had rolled to a bed of hot coals. It seemed a whole century would pass before I would roll free, a century in which I was seared to the deepest levels of my body to the fearful breath within me, and the breath seared and heated to the point of explosion. It'll all be over in a flash, I thought as I rolled clear. It'll all be over in a flash, but not yet. The men on the other side were waiting, red faces swollen as though from a pop plexi, as they bent forward in their chairs. Seeing their fingers coming toward me, I rolled away as a fumbled football rolls off the receiver's fingertips back into the coals. The time, this time, I luckily sent the rug sliding out of place and heard the coins ringing against the floor, and the boys scuffling to pick them up, and the MC calling, All right, boys, that's all. Go get dressed and get your money. I was as limp as a dish rag. My back felt as though it had been beaten with wires. When we had dressed, the MC came in and gave us each five dollars, except Tatlock, who got ten for being last in the ring. Then he told us to leave. I was not to get a chance to deliver my speech, I thought. I was going out into the dim alley in despair when I stopped and was told to go back in. I returned to the ballroom where the men were pushing back their chairs and gathering in groups to talk. The MC knocked on a table for quiet. Gentlemen, he said. We almost forgot an important part of the program, a most serious part, gentlemen. This boy was brought here to deliver a speech which he made at his graduation yesterday. Bravo! I am told that he is the smartest boy we've got out there in Greenwood. I'm told he knows more big words than a pocket-sized dictionary. Much applause and laughter from the crowd. So now, gentlemen, I want you to give him your attention. There was still laughter as I faced them my mouth dry, my eye throbbing. I began slowly, but evidently my throat was tense because they began shouting, Louder! Louder! We of the younger generation extol the wisdom of that great leader and educator, I shouted, who first spoke these flaming words of wisdom. A ship lost at sea for many days suddenly sighted a friendly vessel. From the mast, that unfortunate vessel was seen a signal. Water, water, we die of thirst. The answer from the friendly vessel came back. Cast down your bucket where you are. The captain of the distressed vessel, at last heeding the injunction, cast down his bucket, and it came up full of fresh sparkling water from the mouth of the Amazon River. And like him I say, and in his words, to those of my race who depend upon bettering their condition in a foreign land, or who underestimate the importance of cultivating friendly relations with the southern white man, who is his next-door neighbor, I would say, cast down your bucket where you are, cast it down in making friends in every manly way of the people of all races by whom we are surrounded. I spoke automatically, and with such fervor that I did not realize that the men were still talking and laughing until my dry mouth filling up with blood from the cut almost strangled me. I coughed, wanting to stop and go to one of the tall, brass, sand-filled spittoons to relieve myself. But a few of the men, especially the superintendent, were listening, and I was afraid. So I gulped it down, blood, saliva, and all, and continued. What powers of endurance I had during those days. What enthusiasm. What a belief in the rightness of things. I spoke even louder in spite of the pain. But still they talked and still they laughed as though deaf with cotton 
and dirty ears. So I spoke with greater emotional emphasis. I closed my ears and swallowed in my blood until I was nauseated. The speech seemed a hundred times as long as before, but I could not leave out a single word. All had to be said. Each memorized nuance considered, rendered, nor was that all. Whenever I uttered a word of three or more syllables, a group of voices would yell for me to repeat it. I used the phrase, social responsibility, and they yelled, What's that word you say, boy? Social responsibility, I said. What? Social. Louder. Responsibility. More. Responsa. Repeat. Sibility. The room filled with the uproar of laughter until, no doubt, distracted by having to gulp down my blood, I made a mistake and yelled a phrase I had often seen denounced in newspaper editorials, heard debated in private. Social. What? They yelled. Equality. The laughter hung smoke-like in the sudden stillness. I opened my eyes, puzzled. Sounds of displeasure filled the room. The MC rushed forward. They shouted hostile phrases at me, but I did not understand. A small, dry, mustached man in the front row blared out, Say that slowly, son. What, sir? What you just said. Social responsibility, sir, I said. You weren't being smart, were you, boy? He said, not unkindly. No, sir. You sure about that? Equality was a mistake? <coughs> oh, yes, sir, I said. I was swallowing blood. Well, you had better speak more slowly so we can understand. We mean to do right by you, but you've got to know your place at all times. All right, now, go on with your speech. I was afraid. I wanted to leave, but I also wanted to speak, and I was afraid they'd snatch me down. Thank you, sir, I said, beginning where I had left off, and having them ignore me, just as before. Yet when I finished, there was thunderous applause. I was surprised to see the superintendent come forth with a package wrapped in white tissue paper and gesturing for quiet, addressed the men. Gentlemen, you see that I did not overpraise this boy. He makes a good speech, and someday he'll lead his people in the proper paths. And I don't have to tell you that that is important in these days and times. This is a good, smart boy. And so to encourage him in the right direction, in the name of the Board of Education, I wish to present him a prize in the form of this. He paused, removing the tissue paper and revealing a gleaming calfskin briefcase. In the form of the first class article from Shad Whitmore's shop. Boy, he said, addressing me, take this prize and keep it well. Consider it a badge of office. Prize it. Keep developing as you are, and someday it will be filled with important papers that will help to shape the destiny of your people. I was so moved that I could hardly express my thanks. A rope of bloody saliva forming a shape like an undiscovered continent drooled upon the leather, and I wiped it quickly away. I felt an importance that I had never before dreamed. Open it and see what's inside, I was told. My fingers a tremble. I complied, smelling the fresh leather and finding an official looking document inside. It was a scholarship to the State College for Negroes. My eyes filled with tears and I ran awkwardly off the floor. I was overjoyed. I did not even mind when I discovered that the gold pieces I had scrambled for in the ruckus were of brass pocket tokens advertising a certain make of automobile. When I reached home, everyone was excited. Next day, the neighbors came to congratulate me. I even felt safe from grandfather, whose deathbed curse usually spoiled my triumphs. I stood beneath his photograph with my briefcase in hand and smiled triumphantly into his stolid black peasant's face. It was a face that fascinated me. The eyes seemed to follow everywhere I went. That night, I dreamed I was at a circus with him and that he refused to laugh at the clowns no matter what they did. Then later he told me to open my briefcase and read what was inside, and I did, finding an official envelope stamped with the state seal. And inside the envelope I found another, and another, endlessly, and I thought I would fall out of weariness. Them's years, he said. Now open that one. And I did, and in it I found an engraved document containing a short message in letters of gold. Read it, my grandfather said, out loud. 
to whom it may concern, I intone, keep this n-word boy running. I awoke with the old man's laughter ringing in my ears. It was a dream I was to remember and dream again for many years after, but at that time I had no insight into its meaning. First, I had to attend college. <laughs>